Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Emily Jane Davis. I'm an associate professor here in the College of Forestry in the Department of Forest Ecosystems and Society. And I'm going to be your host today. This is the final lecture of the 2023 Starker series. And I'm just really glad to see you all here today. Uh, as a quick housekeeping note, if any of you are looking for continuing education credits, those forms are up there in the upper corner of the room and you can grab one. Um, so I'd like to get started by acknowledging that Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon is located within the traditional homelands of the Marys River or Pinafu Band of Paukuya. Following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, Paukuya people were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, living descendants of these people are part of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians. Thank you. I'm also going to get started by telling you a little bit about the Starker family. So the Starker lectures were established in 1985 by the Starker family to commemorate the lives and professional contributions of TJ and Bruce Starker. These visionary men were both graduates of OSU's College of Forestry. Um, and indeed, TJ was in the first graduating class and went on to be one of the college's early professors. TJ lived what he taught and he began purchasing and reforesting the cutover forest lands around Corvallis. In time, these lands became what we know today as the Starker Forests, a family forestry organization that exemplifies what it means to be sustainable and community-minded. This year, we've been celebrating the 38th year of the series, and the theme of the 2023 series is innovation in forestry. And I think we all know that forestry has a long history of innovation amidst changing physical, social, and economic conditions. We also have more recent innovations, uh, technical, technological innovations that include the use of geospatial analysis, sensing tools, and artificial intelligence that improve outcomes in the woods as well as in mills and construction. We also make changes in our choices as a community through social innovation. This year, we've had lecturers who looked at some historical changes as well as new innovations. And today we're going to end that, the series this year on a special note by talking about social innovation. We're going to hear about place-based ways of stewarding our forests, fish, waters, and wildfire. And I'm honored to introduce two valued, and colle two valued colleagues and friends who will be doing that today. Michelle Medley Daniel and Mindy Crandall are our guest speakers, and they'll be taking you inside stories of local efforts where people are intertwined and working together to take on innovative ways of adapting to climate change, sharing resources, and living with each other in the land. And you might be wondering, how does this come into a series that's been about technological advancements, wood processing advancements? Um, this rightfully belongs in a lecture series about social innovation because these are about innovation because these are crucial forms of social and human innovation. They're going to tell stories today about the kinds of transformation that's possible when people engage in relationships with their places, and then in doing so, they imagine and they create more sustainable, inclusive, and just futures. I'll introduce our speakers now. Um, Michelle Medley Daniel is the Deputy Director of the Watershed Center, which is a place-based organization that was started in the mid-1990s in Hayfork, California. In her role as Deputy Director, Michelle supports program strategy and operations from field crews to national policy work. In addition to her leadership role at the Watershed Center, Michelle has spent the last decade working to support community-based organizations across the United States as they envision and act on wildfire resilience. Michelle co-directs the National Fire Networks Partnership, which empowers communities to advance better fire futures through place-based solutions. She co-directs this partnership with staff from the Nature Conservancy and the USDA Forest Service through a trio of networks that together support hundreds of community-based fire leaders from Hawaii to New Jersey, and 33 states in between. Michelle has lived in Hayfork since 1990. We also have Dr. Mindy Crandall with us today. Mindy Crandall, who many of you know, is an assistant professor in the Department of Forest and Engineering Resources and Management here in the College of Forestry. She is a forester and forest economist by training and currently teaches forest policy and forest policy analysis. Her primary research projects include a comparative analysis of policies and policy trajectories impacting private forest landowners across the US the impacts of wildfire on vulnerable communities and forestry workforce issues. Prior to becoming a professor, Mindy worked in community-based and consensus advocacy groups, as well as for community-guided outreach for OSU Extension. And Mindy is a native of Otis, Oregon. A quick note before I turn it over to Michelle, in line with the nature of what we are going to be talking about today in social innovation, we designed this lecture so that Mindy and Michelle will be sharing this space, perhaps 
a little more differently than you might expect from a traditional lecture. They are going to each take a few turns discussing where they're from, where they work now, and what they think the future holds. And this is because doing place-based work takes more than one voice, it has more than one story. And I think you will really enjoy it. With that, I would like to now welcome Michelle to begin. She's going to further bring us into some understanding of what place-based innovation means. Please join me in welcoming Michelle. Thanks so much, EJ, and welcome everyone. Thanks so much for being here on this beautiful afternoon. I wanna thank the Starker family for um, hosting this series and for the awesome tour we got to go on earlier today. I definitely saw the value of stewardship of the land over time in your work, um, and that really resonates with me and my stories. Um, so as EJ said, we really want to bring you into some story about place and thinking about story itself as social innovation. So we're going to be um, trading things back and forth, and um, hopefully you'll be able to come along this journey with us. Before we get started in our own stories, though, we want to do a little bit of um, defining terms. So what do we mean by social innovation? We tested this before. Let's see. Maybe I need to name belts for it. Let's see if I can advance. Okay, we can click to advance. Okay. We're innovating right now. <laughs> um, so social innovation is a novel solution to a societal problem that is more effective, efficient, sustainable, or just than existing solutions and for which the value created accrues primarily to society as a whole rather than private individuals. So there's several points of that definition that I think are really important to highlight. So solutions that are, are more sustainable or just, that's a really important part of place-based work. Um, and for value to accrue primarily for society, again, that's a good intersection with place-based work. What do we actually mean by place-based work? Um, place-based work happens at the intersection of people and the places that they share. It's the work that community members define and decide to do in order to advance their shared vision. And it centers the relationship of people to place and to each other. It integrates place as part of community and community as rooted in place. So how are social innovation and place-based work related? We know that right now across the globe, natural systems of which humans are a part are at tipping points. Adaptive capacity, creativity, and social innovation are more important than ever. The complexity and urgency of the issues we're facing require us to attend to the relationships and systems of which we're part. And place-based work offers us a way to approach that work. Today, we're going to share with you stories about social innovation in the form of place-based efforts to manage fisheries, fire, and forests. And we're gonna talk really about three main themes. These aren't themes that are present in every single place-based um, effort, but they're things that we found in common across all of the stories that we've been engaged with. And so we really wanted to highlight the value and role that traditional and local cultures play, that institutional capacity has, and that shared sense and decision-making play in place-based solutions. So I'm gonna get us started by sharing a little bit about my own personal story in Hayfork, California. So as you can see there, Hayfork really is at the geographic heart of Trinity County in far Northern California. Um, it's my hometown. It's a community of about 2,500 people in the middle of, of the county. It's really isolated. It takes 45 minutes to drive to the next community. And it's um, the whole county is about 3,200 square miles. So that's about the size of Delaware and Rhode Island combined. That space is occupied by 16,000 people. So we're very remote, very rural communities um, tucked in the middle of national forests. 80% of that land base is a federal landscape. My, my community in particular of Hayfork in the red there is Norelma Quintu land. It's the largest valley in Trinity County and was used as an agricultural center by colonial settlers who came during the gold rush and began mining, logging, and ranching. The community grew fueled by logging and milling the large diameter Douglas fir forests that encircle the valley. Part of why that population is so low is because that is all Trinity National Forest land. 
This town where I was uh, lived, where I lived since I was a child and was raised, um, had a mill that employed over 40% of our community. Then in the mid 90s, the mill closed as part of the timber wars and we were left trying to figure out who we wanted to be and how we wanted to relate to the land around us. So I'm gonna share the story of the Watershed Center in kind of three chapters today. Chapter one is back in 1992. It's 1992 and we're on the school bus headed to pick up the kids who live off Big Creek Road. I'm 10. One of my classmates sits next to me on the green vinyl bus seat. She's been crying. Her dad works at the mill and she's afraid they will have to move this summer. She doesn't want to move to Lincoln, the community in the Central Valley where some of the mill workers are relocating. At the grocery store, people talk about how Hayfork is going to become a ghost town. It's hard to imagine all the life and people draining out of the valley, but I can tell the adults are scared, and to a 10-year-old, that is unsettling. My five-year-old brother has a pair of overalls with a little cartoon owl stitched on the front. My mom takes a seam ripper to it. She doesn't want anyone to think our family is taking sides. We moved to Hayfork in 1990, when my dad was hired as the math teacher at Hayfork High. There were 200 kids at Hayfork High School then. That same year, Lynn Jungworth, who I knew as a classmate's mom, went in to talk to some of those high school students about their career plans. She and her husband, Jim, had been invited to talk to the students about entrepreneurship. She left that class worried. So many of the students had planned to work at the mill or in the woods, and they had no plan B. Two years later, Lynn would go on to found a nonprofit organization, the Watershed Research and Training Center. In addition to the cultural crisis the community faced, we had an institutional problem. With the mill closed and losing both of those shifts, as well as the associated logging, trucking, and forest service jobs, we needed an institution that could employ people. The Watershed Center was originally intended to be a temporary project that would help transition the community from the economy had to whatever was next but we didn't know what that was yet. So we started experimenting. We built off of the skills that the people in our community had. If we couldn't cut big trees, we thought, well, let's cut small trees. <laughs> let's figure out how we can use these little, little trees and do some small diameter logging. We used a small um, yarder. We in, had all kinds of innovative, lo innovative logging techniques. And we tried to figure out how to put those same woods workers back into the woods doing similar work that they had before, even if we couldn't cut down the bigger trees that ran our mill. We started doing survey work. So we started actually counting the owls that people <laughs> were so frustrated with. Um, and we counted mollusks and all kinds of other little creatures as part of the Forest Service's new approach of adaptive management. Um, and we started trying to figure out how to use non-timber forest products. So you can see these ladies were in the drying shed. This was uh, one of the old mill sheds and we were, we were innovating using mullen and different kinds of non-timber forest products and trying to figure out markets and different uses for some of our understory plants. We tried to figure out how to set up a sort yard. If we weren't gonna have a big mill, maybe we could take those little logs, maybe we could turn some of them into posts and poles. We had an economizer that made two by fours. We tried to think about how we could add value to producing things out of that small waste wood. But that was really, really hard. We tried a lot of versions of sort yards um, and none of them really panned out economically. We also started a fuels reduction crew. We realized that we had a frequent fire forest and that we were really gonna need to start working um, on reducing our fuel loads. So we hired people to work with chainsaws and do fuels reduction. We also realized that our youth needed pathways still. And so we created a youth job program that was mainly focused on working for the forest service, clearing their, their trails every year. But we didn't just stay working on the work that we had done in the past and sort of getting those loggers back working in the woods. Um, while most of that early work was focused on leveraging the job skills that community members already had, we knew that we needed to think about stewarding our fisheries as well and that there were, could be jobs related to that. We also knew we wanted to work with local kids 
because we weren't guided by a business plan, but by the needs, assets, and interests of our community members. So now I want to hand things off to Mindy, who's going to share a little bit about place-based work from her life and experience. Thanks everyone for being here and thanks Michelle for getting us started. <clears throat> Many of us are motivated by our place of origin. Maybe we're motivated to study things that are familiar. Maybe we're motivated to take a job by seeing it from a young age. Maybe some of us are motivated to work for collaboration and natural resources management because we've seen firsthand what conflict brings. The systems we're talking about today are fundamentally interconnected. I'm even trying to move away from the term complex ecological and social systems, because how can one separate out the forest or the fisheries from the humans who manage, use, alter, care for, preserve, destroy, and are sustained by them? We have complex systems of decision-making, land allocations, governance overlaid on complex systems with biological limits, known and unknown interactions between organisms and stochastic disturbances. So the real question is how can we be in this system and get sustainable, equitable, predictable resource use and benefits? Um, as Michelle said, the complexity and urgency of these, of these issues demands new solutions. So we're gonna turn now to two places on the Pacific Ocean. And those of you who have been in class with me know that I always start with this slide and it's a quiz in class. And I say, can you tell where I'm from? Well, you already heard in the bio where I'm from, but this is um, Lincoln City on the bottom left there and Otis, which is just, uh, if you know Otis, it's just a cluster of homes and four businesses in the coast range. This landscape is probably pretty familiar to many of you. It's a common view in Western Oregon. We have productive soils, large valuable trees, beautiful scenic coastline, ocean fish and shellfish resources. We have the interplay of the federal lands with the private lands, the federal lands being in dark green with the nice straight lines around them, and then the private lands over here with our clear cuts. And I think one thing that many of us share who grew up or experienced this environment during the 80s and 90s is that direct experience of conflict over resource management and that rural economic uncertainty that Michelle alluded to. So this place and these conditions have greatly influenced my research and my teaching and my career. <laughs> um, in my research, I do a lot of work looking at how rural youth in places of shifting or declining economies, traditional resource-based economies, view their options and goals for the future. And my own interest is fueled by this in understanding how we can develop management systems that benefit more local people sustainably. One of the key points in this landscape from where I grew up is the fish hatchery along the Salmon River. Before I understood anything about salmon or complex management, resource management systems, this was just a fun and fascinating place for a rural kid with nothing much to do to go visit whenever they wanted to, because you couldn't really get anywhere else. It was a half mile bike ride from my house and it was a great place to go to regardless of the weather, which is also important in the Oregon coast range. Uh, I spent a lot of time walking on these grates over the tanks and if it was sunny, the fry would follow your shadow because they thought that you were gonna feed them. And there were all these tanks where you could watch the different stages of the fish and then you could go back in the fall and watch the salmon come up the river and come up the fish ladder to the hatchery to be harvested. Salmon are a really integral part of the Pacific Northwest. The ecosystems, animals, and humans. Entire cultures are built around salmon. Livelihoods are dependent on salmon. They're a really direct and literal tie between the ocean and the land because they deliver nutrients between these two systems. About the same time as the injunction against federal harvest came to the Pacific Northwest to protect remaining old growth and land habitat for wildlife, there was a need to deal with declining salmon populations as well. And those first populations were, the first listings came in 1982 to 1994. And Oregon Coastal Coho was proposed for listing in 1995. And this is an old picture taken from along the Salmon River of some tribal and non-tribal fishers in the early 1900s. Salmon re recovery is an interesting 
uh, issue because it requires cooperation and investment from forest companies harvesting along the headwaters, better care and maintenance of water quality in neighborhoods and houses all along the river and downstream, reestablishment of functioning estuary habitat that was diked frequently and drained for colonial settlement, and agreements and cooperation among commercial and recreational harvesters. Um, at the time in the 90s, Oregon wanted to do something different to manage this complex system. And I think it's a really interesting part of our shared sort of social innovation history, if you will. Under then Governor Kitz Haber, the state proposed the Oregon Plan for Salmon and Watersheds. It was a, to be a collaborative multi-stakeholder effort to facilitate restoration of populations. The plan laid the foundation for the creation of watershed councils that would operate across all landowners in an ecologically defined area, unlike municipal or politically defined areas, such that habitat issues could be addressed in this cohesive headwaters to estuary manner. It was a really interesting attempt to try to create a more local system than the, typically what's done under the ESA to address the problem. And it was motivated in part by this same experience of having seen what happened during the timber wars. This article from the High Country News in 1998 kind of highlights that, that Kitzhaber had experienced close, in, close at hand the potential failure of federal listings. So <clears throat> Oregon wanted to use the Oregon plan as a way to restore salmon without a listing under the ESA. And National Marine Fishery Service, now NOAA Fisheries, signed an MOU, a memorandum of understanding at the time, indicating their willingness to maintain coastal coho in candidate status while this plan was enacted. However, the Endangered Species Act doesn't give a lot of wiggle room, right? It's very clear what the responsibilities of the managing agencies are. If the best evidence is that a species is endangered or likely to become so, they have to list the species. They cannot incorporate proposed voluntary actions into their decision. And that's just what the courts found in a lawsuit against the federal government over its failure to lift, list. So coastal coho were ultimately listed. <clears throat> we do still have the Oregon plan, including local watershed councils that facilitate great restoration work across landowners. But the actual management of the more of the system and the harvest and everything is done at a higher level. Which brings me to the second coastal place we're gonna visit. This is the west coast of Vancouver Island. And it's a little hard to tell, but the, the blue at the very bottom is water, but all the dark green is water as well. It's just shallower water in this Google Earth image. That big area in the uh, middle there is Barclay Sound, and there's a long string running up here that is the Alberni Inlet that goes up to Port Alberni. The past two years, I've led a class here to see and learn about local innovations in salmon management. So some activities on Vancouver Island look a lot like what we see around here. They include integrated large-scale restoration projects um, that restore critical spawning and rearing habitat to support healthy populations. Here's our class learning about a very intense uh, restoration project near Chiwat Lake, which is in the Pacific Rim National Park and home of the Dot First Nation. Our hosts here are biologists involved in the restoration and three folks from the DDDOT First Nation as well. So some of the activity up there looks very similar to what we're doing down here, but some of it is very unique and similar to other places and resources around the Pacific Northwest. A couple of decades ago, um, the gridlock and conflict over the harvest of limited salmon coming up the sound into these uh, rivers and inlets got to a point where shots were fired. And so it led a few local people to insist that there must be a better way. Here are two of our hosts describing that better way that they found to our class. It's called the Barkley Harvest Round Table. And it's a group of stakeholders that meets weekly during the salmon harvest season to actively allocate harvest catch on the run, on the fly. It's a consensus-based process. So every representative has to agree to the group's decisions for it to move forward. Um, they are allocating catch among external commercial fishermen from far away, local First Nations fishers, and local non-native fishers and recreational fishers. So the group emerged out of this specific place with specific challenges. So while it's unique, there's also some lessons to be learned, and this ties back into what Michelle presented with us as our themes. 
And the first is that this roundtable was born out of local culture, and it rests on, con on contributions from both the First Nations groups as well as the other locals. And to get to this point, one key thing that had to happen was that the folks in the town, the Port Alberni, the non-native town, had to understand that the First Nations harvest of salmon was actually an economic benefit to their town and led to a contribution in their town. So this shared understanding that everyone benefited from each other's resource use, this understanding of the interconnectedness of the systems, helped build a common desire for equitable outcomes among everyone. And while I keep using the term local people, I want to point out that not everybody participating here grew up here. Um, our host, Andy, here in the blue coat pointing, he's actually from Astoria, just up the road. You don't have to be born and raised somewhere to put your energy into helping find solutions. And so one of the things we ask them is, what about trust? How do you, as someone from away, how do you get integrated and build this capacity to work on these issues? Because consensus, in particular, consensus decision-making requires a belief that everyone is acting in good faith. Andy described a deep feeling of community, even though he was from away, that enabled him to participate, and even though he was not a tribal person. He actually represented the tribes in these roundtables. Another key element here is that the benefits are received locally. So in the First Nations and in the town, which which motivates people to invest the time and energy into building trust and equitably managing the resource. Not every place has this. Lincoln City Otis doesn't have this, right? Um, those benefits that come from the use of those resources don't really accrue in that place. The shallow bay allows for opportunistic harvest, but no commercial fishing. Timber has been cut for decades, but it primarily flows to the valley for processing. And so most of that economic benefit leaves that place. Another factor contributing to the success of the Harvest Roundtable is this real-time data and information that they have on returning salmon. So every week, the participants get these updated counts of salmon coming in through the sound. They also get updated model results um, that forecast the likely returns over the season that is based on decades of monitoring and, and local experience in the sound. Everyone who participates trusts that this information is an accurate description of reality. And this information in science is a huge part of the institutional capacity that allows this place-based work to happen. Sometimes it's hard to imagine that just knowing reality is innovation, but I think shared truth is really important. And we're sort of on this cusp right now where we are living in an age of a capacity to create any reality that we want. So having that shared truth is, is essential. Collaborative management rests on that, that's acknowledged by all parties and visible. And that's sometimes easier to accomplish when you share a physical space, when you're at the hatchery and you can see how many smolts are being raised, where they're gonna go, and you can see the counts of them coming back up. You don't have to rely on anyone else's interpretation. So place-based knowledge, trust, and work helps create and sustain this shared sense-making that enables this equitable collective decision-making. Place-based management, where the economic benefits are realized in that place, motivates these actors to work together for that societal benefit rather than the personal benefit. And these processes can grow and spread, which is where Michelle's going to take us next. Thanks so much, Mindy. So um, we're back in Trinity County um, in that heart of uh, uh, Northern California. Um, and you can see our fire history map here. Um, the fire history map that I had before I pulled this one down for this presentation just went through 2019. And so that entire red block down at the bottom of the August complex wasn't on the map. Um, in the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of fire in Trinity County. Um, but fire has always been a shaping force in the Klamath Siskiyous. It's a frequent fire forest that was managed with fire by indigenous people, but a culture of fire suppression reinforced by the ways we were using the forest took hold in the early 1900s. And in Hayfork, many people thought about fire as something that threatened their livelihoods and homes. In the 1987 fires, they were really huge by um, those the standards of the day. And folks got to thinking about, oh, what are we gonna do about these fires? And so the Watershed Center started taking action by being one of the first pilots to create a CWPP. But my fire story starts here with water. 
This is Hapeworks Municipal Water Source. It's Ewing Reservoir. I'm freshly out of college and I'm not sure what to do with my life, so I move home to figure it out. It's 2008 and, I, and the phone on my parents' kitchen counter rings. It's Annette Hale, a woman I've known since I was a kid, and she tells me that she's moving and looking for someone to replace her position as the receptionist at the Watershed Center. I ask her when I can start. On my first day, Annette tells me that my priority is to answer the phone. My second priority is to do whatever else anybody needs done. It took a while to figure out what that meant, um, but over the next few years, I took on several projects for the organization. One of those projects was to help work on an assessment of Big Creek, which is the stream that feeds this reservoir. It was a complex project that had stream flow and condition monitoring, road assessments, community visioning about recreation assets and fire modeling. We counted fish, we collected transect data, we facilitated meetings with our, fire, with our water district and we hosted community picnics. And we modeled what a fire in the upper reaches of Big Creek could do to our reservoir. About the same time, we were invited to join what up to that point had been a TNC internal partnership called the Fire Learning Network. We were invited to join and bring a community-based perspective to this group, which had mostly been for TNC preserve managers to think about bringing fire back to those landscapes. My colleague, Josh, who was the one who led that Big Creek Analysis Project, traveled to Salt Lake to meet with the FLN members, and he came back full of ideas and questions. So we got to work. We started thinking about fire with a focus not so much on wildfire and fear of our communities burning, but more about prescribed fire. We helped form something called the Northern California Prescribed Fire Council, which was designed to create a community of prescribed burners in NorCal. And we started having, figuring out how to burn at home. We developed partnerships with Cal Fire. We trained our crews and we created agreements with our volunteer fire departments. We worked with landowners to burn next to their homes, and the organization's focus shifted a little bit from the wood utilization we had been working on to our relationship with fire. That shift doesn't mean we stopped creating stewardship jobs, but it did reflect the new reality of much larger and more frequent, fly frequent fires, and it highlights that we needed to think about our fire culture. From 2008 to 2023, we've had several significant fires, one of which resulted in the evacuation of most of our staff for multiple weeks. This picture in the middle is the base of the hill where I live. Um, it's a little bit difficult to see, but that uh, the monument fire was, we thought was gonna burn downtown for many weeks. <laughs> Every day we thought that the next operational period was the time when we were going to lose town and it didn't happen. Um, but it was really, really challenging to have been working in this sort of pro-fire culture and building up people's idea about fire and also trying to reconcile that with the, re the reality that we had some serious fire problems that we also needed to deal with and take care of. Um, so we've been trying to reconcile that. We've been trying to recognize that that's what being in relationship with fire is. Um, sometimes we have to deal with the kind of smoke that you see in the upper left hand. Sometimes we get to be working together with our volunteer fire departments doing prescribed burning, and sometimes we're doing the post-fire cleanup. Mindy and I have been sharing stories about our communities, but place-based work, as Mindy said, isn't just for locals. You don't have to be born and raised in the place to engage with it in a meaningful way. So to demonstrate this, we've asked EJ to share a story about place-based work that she's been involved with. Yes, I'm the intermission between Michelle's chapters two and three. I guess books don't have intermissions though. So um, I'm going to speak for a little bit about the Blue Mountains of Eastern Oregon, which probably feels kind of far away from the Willamette Valley on this green and gray day here. Um, it's a place that's been really important to me in my work. Uh, the Blues is actually an eco region. It's in fact uh, the largest of Oregon's eco regions and the blue area within there is the extent of national forest land that's managed by the U.S. Forest Service. Um, this is home to the Cayuse, Nez Perce, Tenino, Umatilla, and Northern Paiute peoples as well. Who has spent any time in this part of Oregon? Quite a few people. Is anyone from there? Okay. But many of you are familiar with this place, so you know that when you're there, it 
it smells like that dry butterscotch of the ponderosa pine and it feels like that roughness of the bark under your hand and it sounds like those surprisingly cold and fast streams and rivers that are running off the mountains and providing fish habitat um, and many of us may not know that these forests actually held the most commercial timber in the U.S. between the Cascades and the Rockies. For me, these are also these forests are also places where I learned some of my earliest and hardest lessons about collaboration and the connection of people to the land. I was working to help start and facilitate federal forest collaborative groups, um, people who were trying to seek agreement about how we should manage these east side forests. And that's where I learned a lot about the circumstances under which people can can't work together. And I also learned a lot about my strengths and weaknesses as a person. And I'm just one of so many people who have been drawn to the blues and and to this place. I, I was trying to think about why is it so compelling? Why would I tell a story about it? As Michelle notes, I'm not from the blues. I, I think it's because even though it's beautiful, even though people have a strong connection to the land economically and socially, I think it's its complexity. And we as humans are often really drawn to that complexity. So for example, places like this in the Strawberry Mountains that can receive over 100 inches of precipitation in a year coexist with other parts of the Blue Mountains, which are dry, um, sage, and rangeland and can receive less than nine inches a year. And given that, that ecological diversity, the history of how humans have lived in and used the forests of the Blues and the meaning that they have for it is also really varied. And complexity is not easy, it comes with challenge. Uh, the diversity of values that people hold for the blues makes questions about how to manage forests and other resources there really contentious. So there have been a lot of debates about motorized access to national forest land and what that should look like. There's conflict over how to handle the growing wolf populations and their impact on cattle ranching. Grant County was also the scene of the roadside standoff that ended the Malheur Refuge occupation and last year at the location of the arrest of a Forest Service burn boss during a prescribed fire. It is in the headlines. At the same time, it's a place where collaboration has sprung, even in the face of contention. Uh, this is a picture of the Blue Mountains Forest Partners, which is a collaborative group that works on the Malheur National Forest. It contains people from industry, environmental groups, local community, and scientists. And they try to come together and build shared agreements and a vision for how the Malheur National Forest is going to be managed. Uh, this is not just social discussion and conversation, it's had material outcomes. They helped retain the milling infrastructure in this area, which anyone who's familiar with Eastern Oregon knows there is not very much of that left. And it's really important to be able to economically manage those lands. And they've also been able to accomplish the implementation of many more acres of landscape restoration and forest health projects. Um, this story, you, some of you may have heard it before, it's often seen and held up as innovative because it's about people getting along. And in that way, it's a very Northwestern story that we like to hear about loggers and environmentalists um, learning to stop arguing and find common ground. But what's innovative about it as well is it has engaged scientists, some from our college community, students, federal land managers, and all these other partners in robust dialogue about really hard questions. So how do we maintain mature and old growth forest structure while we're also reducing the risk of the uncharacteristic wildfire? How do we protect wildlife while doing so? And when fires happen, how can we avoid becoming mired in debates about post-fire logging and instead use those events as opportunities to learn and generate new knowledge? So importantly, as this group has grappled with these questions, they've leaned heavily on science, scientists, but also their own values and needs, and I've put that into an interplay. And I'll just note that it does also take more than just getting along or learning about science to move to different ways of being and knowing and working on the land. We also need collective capacity to take action and make real the changes that we want to see. So today in the Blues, we have partners continuing to work like the Blue Mountains Forest Partners. We have others innovating even further on projects that attract new funds and that coordinate public and private land managers together. Um, such as the Northern Blues All Lands Restoration Partnership and the John Day Valley Landscape Resiliency Project, which is depicted in this photo here. And these are supported by faculty from OSU Extension's higher program. Each of these efforts works in the Blues because they center, they center local leadership. They bring in scientific and external partners who respect that local leadership. And they get that hard work of actually planning the coordinated implementation of treatments done. 
This partnership has resulted in uh, assessment of over 74,000 acres of private land and $10 million in grant funding in the last year. So I'm, I appreciate the opportunity to have done this intermission. I'm going to hand it back to Michelle. I'm just going to say that the Blues is a special place where a lot has become possible, and it's similar to the places that Michelle and Mindy have talked about. Um, and that exploring these stories, I think, illuminates new possibilities. So we're hoping that by hearing about several different places, you leave here with a sense of hope, and especially for how what can happen in a place can have impacts far beyond that place. Michelle's going to talk about that now and how these impacts of place can extend far beyond their geographic boundaries. Thanks so much for sharing that story, EJ. So in this sort of final chapter of my story, it doesn't really take place in Hayfork. Um, all of that work that I talked about before, the wood utilization, the crews, all that place-based work is still part of the Watershed Center's portfolio. We have 150 people working in the woods this summer um, on that work. But one of the things we've been able to do over time is really expand that work so that it's not only our own place-based work that we're doing, but actually supporting other place-based leaders. And so I wanna tell you a little bit about the fire networks now. Um, so in 2013, um, I went on a trip to Boise to help host a workshop where we, along with those partners from TNC that we were working on the Fire Learning Network with, um, a lot, and place-based organizations that we knew, wanted to explore the potential of creating a sister network to FLN. The, uh, this new network would be focused on the relationship of communities and fire, and the people we had gathered together were place-based leaders who were working on fire issues and solutions in their own communities. But those folks often felt isolated in that work and or worse, pitted against one another as they competed for grants. And we knew there would be value in connecting, learning from and supporting those folks. So building on the learning network approach developed by FLN and on the Watershed Center's place-based work and values, we created something called FACNET. For the last 10 years, I've had the honor of working with leaders from communities across the US as they chart pathways toward better fire outcomes. Their work is shaped by community leaders and also influenced by the people they've grown to know and call friends from the community of practice that we've created together. Supporting place-based work is not the same as doing it. I've learned a lot about how to co-manage space, how to be a service leader, how to support the flow of value, throughout a series of complex relationships. And I've learned some lessons that kind of translate from that same place-based work. It's really critical to elevate local knowledge and culture. If you wanna support people's place-based work, you elevate their voices and their knowledge. Celebrate and recognize diversity and the power that culture has to shape systems. We took some particular care to make sure that essential voices from indigenous communities and underrepresented genders and other unique viewpoints were represented and honored in our network as we built it. And this has sometimes meant we have to expand beyond the wildfire space that we were trying to work in, but it's been really, really critical to creating a space where we can really find new solutions together. That same idea of shared sense-making and decisions it's really, really hard. As EJ just described, doing collaborative work requires a lot of process. It requires people to create trust and relationships. And sometimes local folks need some help doing facilitation, getting the right kind of tools to help them do sense making. Sometimes we need outside folks to bring data or other tools. So this is really a place where uh, place-based efforts can benefit from outside folks coming in and helping to do some sense making. And then finally, in the institutional and workforce capacity realm, um, in that first definition of social innovation, we noted that um, it's distinct because it accrues value to society. And one of the important ways this happens in place-based work is through job creation and local economic development. There are entirely new sectors getting developed right now to help address wildfire issues, and we have the opportunity to imagine and create those inclusively. It's not just about drip torches or firefighting. It's about building homes. It's about people actually being able to host workshops and meetings. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, you can see a map of California. Those are all the places where we're helping people organize around place-based prescribed burning associations and efforts. 
So there's a there are a huge variety of ways that people can contribute, but you do need institutions and you need people actually working on the work. One of the complexities with institutional capacity that I think many of us are facing right now, unlike those early days, the watershed center where there was no one to cut the paychecks, there are many, many, many institutions and actors in the space now. And so I think that creates a whole new set of challenges and interesting opportunities for people to try to navigate those systems. It's been amazing to work with the fire networks over the last decade and learn so much from all of these place-based leaders who really are coming up with their own solutions to fire issues, figuring out the unique assets they have to work with and using those as the basis for how they want to live with fire into the future. Um, and I'm happy to share more about that after the talk. If people are interested in specifics. But I wanna wrap up today with um, just kind of a, a metaphor for place-based work. So this um, wildflower that you see on the screen is something that as a kid, we called the cartwheel flowers and they were all over in our yards. They were in my friend's yards. They were on the roadsides. We saw these everywhere. I will admit to having picked a few as a child. They seemed very, very um, common and they, they, were, they were really everywhere. But it wasn't until recently that I learned that this species only exists in the extent that appears on this map. So they really only exist in Hayfork and that little bit of the Trinity watershed. I think this species is a great metaphor for place-based work because what seems common, commonplace or, um, or common sense in context with the people, place, and conditions where it evolved might not stand out to the people that, that are living with it until you realize really how special and rare it is. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Mindy to really close us out. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, I was sitting here as EJ was talking and I was struck one of the things that you mentioned was you need to have this ability to make change. And one of the things I didn't highlight with the Harvest Roundtable that I thought was fascinating learning from them is technically uh, DFO, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada is the one in charge of harvest allocations. They're at the table, but they just adopt whatever the local people say. So it's this de devolving of power down to the local group, even though at the institutional level, that structure is still held by the government. They really are just there as a rubber stamp agent at the end of the process. And that was really brought forward to me and when you were talking, EJ. So I'm going to just kind of wrap us up today. Um, our examples today were from rural forestry and fishing communities, but place-based work isn't inherently rural or it's not inherently about natural resources. There's efforts like this are happening all in all sectors. Um, when we talked about our hometowns, but as EJ showed, you don't have to be from a place to participate in or lead place-based work. It's not restricted to those who grew up there. And in fact, we run a risk of being exclusionary if we think of place-based work only in that frame. To create that space for social innovation, we really have to be thoughtful and deliberate about diversity to avoid replicating and reifying power dynamics within communities. So not just ways of organizing people, but also the recognition of who wasn't there before to organize. How can we involve First Nations, tribal groups, women, underrepresented genders, minority groups in these things that we want to change? How do we make sure that everyone can be a part of place-based work? All of us have been shaped by the places we've lived and worked. We may move to other places and become part of other communities, but for those of us up here, place has been an important teacher in our lives, and I'm sure it has been for you as well. You all have connections to places and people that matter, and how do those experiences get translated into your life and work? We believe that getting connected to where you live can enable you to become part of place-based solutions as well. And with that, I think we're done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle and Mindy. So I'd like to take some questions now. Um, I'll check online as well, but if anyone has a question for either or both of them. I might run the microphone so you can hear it online. Um, yeah, I was curious, uh, sort of towards the end there, where you talked about there was, you know, used to be a dearth of players and place space 
local efforts and now there's so many um what are your insights and your experience in this world of like why what are the underlying forces that are behind that and then just some of the challenges and opportunities you see with that current state Yeah, I can, I can take a first step. Um, I won't make you too much of it. I need to get some steps. <laughs> Excellent. So, yeah, I think um, especially, particularly in the wildfire space, I think because people are recognizing how critical of an inflection point we're really in in fire, there is there are a lot of players. Um, there's a lot of money. When there's new money, there's new organizations and people, and it can really displace efforts that were going on for a long time before. So, you know, across the country, we're seeing this where there's sort of longtime efforts, some of which become subsumed by new efforts, um, some of which kind of are able to take in those new parties and are able to be thoughtful about how to diversify themselves. I think one of the really interesting ways to manage some of this is to think about how to organize at multiple scales. So FIRE really requires us to organize, not just at the place-based level, but to work across boundaries. And so I think that's actually one of the best answers to manage all of that institutional complexity is to really understand who has different kinds of um, assets and jurisdictions and try to help get those a little bit more aligned. So for example, in California, there's a billion dollars in the state budget to work on wildfire, and they're developing new programs to try to help get that money to the ground, but they aren't quite sure where it's headed. And so we're working on some research projects with them right now. They have some um, kind of ID, some theories about trying to use a block grant approach and trying to blend money together so that local folks can determine their own pathway. But that's not the way that most grant programs have worked in the past. Most grant programs are competitive and often end up with similar locations receiving money over and over and over as those same kind of enabling conditions or the, the things we choose for in a lot of those programs get replicated. And so I think institutions, particularly government institutions, have to be really thoughtful about the parameters they set up, where they're really aligning to, and if they think if, if they're getting the outcomes they think they are. Mindy or EJ, what do you guys have anything to add? Any other other questions? We have some questions online. Okay, we've got some online questions. Our first question from online is how do you view the use of asset mapping as a tool for establishing place-based work in a community? Pros and cons, where might it fit best? And any advice? I'm gonna give that to you. Okay, I can take that one. Um, so I think assets-based approaches are really empowering for communities. I think, um, first of all, what is asset mapping and what is assets-based approaches? Probably should say that first. Um, so it's a bas basically a method of working with community members to think about what they have to contribute to solving a problem. So rather than saying, oh my gosh, we have a problem, let's all come together and think about how bad the problem is, how disempowered we are from dealing with that problem, how much struggle this problem is for us, how can we instead come and think about, oh, I have a chainsaw that I can lend to the neighborhood lending library so that we can do this project. Oh, this person has a big garden. They're willing to lend or to offer all the lettuce for a salad for the community's workday. Um, so just really thinking through what people have to change everyone's mindset instead of to the uh, so much focus on the problem to the ways that they have to work together. And through working together, they can come up with new solutions that they might not have been able to see if they just started looking from the problem um, as, the, as their kind of matrix for working together. So I think that's um, a good way to start working. And it can also really help if you're stuck. So if people have been working together for a long time, maybe they have a context they're really used to of how they engage together. I think that's kind of how celebrations come in. Um, often those are based on people really appreciating and having gratitude for one another and the assets that each other bring to the work. And I think pausing to really take stock of those assets is important, especially in issues that are so daunting and generational, like climate change or fire, or any of these issues we've been talking about. Are there other questions in the room? We have a few online, but I want to make sure you're all getting a chance. Actually, why don't you try shouting it out? <laughs> um, I'll stand up. So um, this is all really interesting. And what I my question to you is, what can universities do in their curricula to better prepare people to enter into this realm? 
Thanks, Katie. I'll just repeat that for those who might not have heard it online. And her question was, what can universities do in our curricula to sort of better support these efforts? I think it's a good question. And I um, will say I can't say that I've thought intensely about it. So I'm going to have to think on my feet here a little bit. Um, I do think that there is definitely a role for all of us to play here. We are already teaching our students about super complex systems. That is the heart and soul of what we do in the College of Forestry. Everything we talk about is through this lens of complexity and sustainability. So I think that's a good place to start. I would argue, and this might be my bias coming from someone who teaches a writing class, that we need to focus more on communication um, and training people not just to think from, say, a scientific scientific forestry mindset, but to think about lots of ways of knowing and lots of ways of doing. We are kind of used to pitching ourselves as the experts, as those who know the forest ecosystem, and we do, and we know fire, and we know a lot, a lot of stuff. We're not always so good at listening and valuing people's lived experience in the places where we're working and interacting and managing resources. And I think that's where we really need to do better. Um, and I think we need more emphasis on, you know, the university is, we are changing our um, undergraduate curriculum requirements. We're requiring more on complex systems, on solutions, and on issues of difference, power, and discrimination. Those are the kind of things that I think are going to help people be able to sit in a room, value different forms of knowledge, and work to communicate and come to solutions with patients. Um, and so I think it's a good time for us to be talking about these things. Um, we're increasingly seeing that with new tools, right? We need to teach something different at the university level. We need to teach critical thinking. We need to teach working together. And so I think that there is definitely a role for us to play in augmenting our, we're very strong at teaching traditional skills in forestry. Um, and we need to just work on some more of those soft skills, interpersonal skills. I just want to add that I think it would be great if students uh, had more opportunities to engage with cooperative extension. Mm -hmm. We have some students here today who have worked with the extension fire program and getting to observe firsthand what it's like to do this work, not just in a theoretical way, is really important. Um, I'm going to go to another question online. I love these concepts, but it strikes me that this type of work is very time intensive. How do you get people to join in when competing with their other priorities. Time can feel like a luxury for many. I absolutely. Um, and I think time is something we have to we have to be really thoughtful as we build in process um, for community work that we are thoughtful about it not just being people who can afford to engage, right? If the, if you have kids or a job and you're and all of the meetings and all of the conversations are happening when you have other obligations that automatically excludes you. So I think there's some basic principles and practices that we can build into the ways we work that that are thoughtful about the barriers people would face to engagement and that actually address those in a meaningful way that aren't just oh we'll shift the meeting slightly but oh we're actually going to have childcare on site so that you can bring your kids with you and you can engage knowing that your kids are safe. We have the kindergarten teacher here. We brought them in to help with this meeting. So, you know, things like that that actually meaningful, meaningfully create other participation. I also think that this whole idea of time is really can be really stressful when we feel so much urgency around the issues we're working on. It can feel like, what are we doing talking about the things when town's burning down in a month? You know, it feel it can feel really, really hard to invest. But I think one of the things that we've seen is just how much those relationships really are the foundation of resilience. And so town may burn down in a month, but now you have relationships with people. And those are the things that are going to get us through all the changes. We're probably not actually going to stop all of the bad things from happening. We're not going to be able to turn back all of the clocks. But when we invest in each other and we have strong social networks, those are really adaptive capacity in our communities, and they will help us deal with all kinds of cha challenges and changes that we're facing. I just wanted to add to that. I think that the other thing that we want to be mindful of in speaking of how to create a process structure that enables the most people to participate is also recognizing that 
even if people are there representing their organization, not all organizations have the same capacity. Some pe some organizations can allow people to do that on their work time. They absorb that cost. It's no big deal. But there's a lot of other organizations that you might that have been left behind before that you need to have at the table. And so we need to start thinking about how do we adequately compensate those organizations for the expertise and the time of the people that they are sending if we want those people there. There's just some places have a lot more limited resources, just like some people have a lot more limited resources. And so thinking about that on sort of two levels, both the, the organization and the individual. Have other questions come to mind in the room? Yes. Shout it out. Uh, what do you think about the risks or running into the risks of some of the difficult or challenging aspects of those relationships, like interpersonal conflicts, nepotism, corruption? Um, how, you know, how do how do you deal with that sort of dualism that can occur with uh, very place based close relationships? Yeah, thanks so much for that question. I'm going to repeat it. I'll try to, I won't get all your words maybe, but how, how do we deal with maybe the shadow side of the closeness of relationships, potentially corruption, nepotism, some of the things that um, could be negative about being so having such a close-knit set of people making decisions together or working together? Um, I definitely invite you to join in, but I've, I've got an answer. Um, so yeah, being from a small town, there's a lot of gossip and a lot of, of relationships I, over the past weekend, I, I realized how odd it is that some of my best friends are actually my former teachers. Um, and I was, so I was hanging out at my high school Spanish teacher's house and I was like, this is unique. <laughs> um, so there's definitely a lot of history and it's like, it can be like a big extended family. So there's, there's a lot of really specific cultural dynamics that I think happen in small communities. I think one of the things that I've seen be really important across the fire networks is being willing to get feedback from people who are outside your system and take honest criticism about, hey, are you in a bubble? Have you lost sight of like how your process works and who you're working with? And so having some trusted friends that can give you real harsh feedback sometimes about what's happening is really important. And I think also cre creating that kind of mindset and kind of to Mindy's point about how we want to train people to be in this work, creating a culture in your community and place-based work of learning and being open to change and changing your mindset. It's the best thing that I hear from people is when they change their mind because they've, they've learned something new. And so Figuring out how to hold on to that, even as you're in the work for a long time and you're you're start to think about it in ways that start to become more solid in your own mind. When I first started in fire work, I didn't know anything about fire. I was a total sponge. I was willing to soak up all kinds of different perspectives and ideas. And over this last decade, now I have some pretty specific ideas. And I'm not saying that that won't happen, but I think being open and willing to change my mind and being willing to create space to engage with people in ways that are excited about changing our minds and that are open to that is one way to deal a little bit with that. I think there's also just some like political realities in communities. I mean, in, in Hayfork, one landowner owns seven of the largest private land owning ranches. And that's most of our like private land. So one person who also owns the gas station and the grocery store and the anadromous fishery water rights that predate the town's water rights. It's an extremely powerful individual. So you really need to make friends with them and work really hard to figure out how you can work with them. And I think it's important just to acknowledge that sometimes that is the reality of the systems that we're working in. We have a few more questions online if there's time, Julie. Okay. Um, how do you see the communities, networks, and others that you help support navigating the current times, given the influx of funding from the Inflation Reduction Act, bipartisan investment, et cetera? In other words, when money and funding is no longer the major obstacle, how do you see organizations in these spaces navigating place-based needs and balancing short and long-term goals? Well, money isn't actually the problem. It's the things you need the money for. And, and unfortunately, a lot of the time, 
the money that you get can't actually be for the thing that you need or the thing you need first or the things you need together. And so, well, I totally agree. And I, and we need a lot of investment, both from the government, from the private sector, from philanthropy, from individuals in this space, just the inflation reduction act investments are not going to be all of the investment that we really need to be able to do this work. That money is also largely getting directed into a set of priority landscapes, one of which is my landscape, so I'm pretty aware of, of what that looks like, um, that have didn't get a lot of time to decide this is the priority stuff we want to work on. It was what was in, it was what was on the books already. Those are the projects we're going to implement. So I think while it's great to have those investments, I think we would be really wise to think about a different kind of time horizon for giant investments of this nature. We really need to be getting ahead of the curve. That's why we need to be thinking about next generation projects and thinking about things that could actually be transformative instead of expecting that we can get millions of dollars and put that into projects that were planned five or 10 years ago and get transformative outcomes. I have a question for you, Mindy. This builds off Katie's earlier question. How can scientists doing applied research think about ways to thoughtfully engage and support place-based work? What opportunities or challenges do you see? Um, I think that's a great question. And it's one I ask myself all the time because now in this role here as a researcher, yeah, what can we do? Um, I think for me, there's sort of two things that I would start for that process. Number one is ask the people doing the work what they need to know. I think that's just sort of a fundamental way to start research is going to, whenever you see an exciting, innovative place, going and asking them what piece of information wouldn't help your work be easier. Um, I really prefer to do work that's grounded in people's needs. The other thing is to remember that we have a whole network of people out there doing this work and sitting at the interface of research and community development, and that's our extension agents. And I don't think we do enough to really bridge that on-campus extension gap, even including the extension agents who are on campus, not lumping them in with on-campus folks, because we don't integrate enough. So I think that just mostly paying attention to the needs of the people, it's it's great if we can advance some social theory, but really who's gonna read that? No one, well, maybe a couple people. Um, but what would be much better is to say, how can we support the work that's going on? Um, the folks that I've been interacting with up in BC, you know, they have a fascinating story and we're working on building that now, but it takes time as well. You can't just jump into a place as an external researcher and expect to, to give them some gift of your knowledge. So this is a process that's gonna take us probably three years to develop a research question that will um, enable something useful to come out for them and advance the knowledge as well for us. It's gonna take lots of trips back and forth. It takes that same time investment that it does for people who are involved in the place-based work. And again, it should always be rooted in the needs of the people and their perspectives not what I think is unique about their place, but what they're gonna tell me is unique. So for us as researchers, we have to invest the time as well. We have to develop the relationships, develop the trust that we're acting in good faith and that we're not just there to extract knowledge the same way that outsiders have extracted resources before. Michelle, I'd like you to answer that question as well because in your work, both in Hay Fork and with Fire Fire Networks, you receive a lot of inquiry from researchers. So do you have some advice you'd like to give to researchers about how to engage with people like you? Yeah, I would definitely echo Mindy's advice that before you embark on a research project, it's really important to understand what you're trying to learn and how that's going to benefit everyone. Um, there's been a there are a wide variety of people who are interested in the fire networks because it's the sort of ready-made sample set of different kinds of communities that you know cross all kinds of different organizational um, leadership structures and eco regions and you know it, it's a very attractive group of people and so we've had to be really thoughtful about how we partner with researchers and not sort of have it be a feeding frenzy of like oh look here's a ready-made sample set. One of the things we thought a lot about because 
there's a lot of trust that we built within our networks. And so there was sort of some, um, if, if we introduced ideas, often people thought, oh, well, these are ideas that are sort of being, you know, endorsed by the staff and I should do these. They want me to do this. So we've had to be really thoughtful about saying, here's an opportunity. You should evaluate it and think about how it's going to benefit your work. We are not suggesting you need to do that and being really explicit about saying that. Um, it kind of goes back to one of those other questions. I think sometimes networks can, while they can transfer awesome knowledge, they can also be vectors for things that aren't going to work. Um, from place to place. Those same flowers I was showing that only live in the Trinity River corridor, there's a reason for that. And it's because they probably can't survive in other places. And sometimes place-based solutions are like that. They grew in the place that they were for. And when you try to plant them somewhere else, they will wither and die. <laughs> and so, and you could waste a lot of time having someone try to replicate everything you're doing. And so I think that that's an important thing for researchers and place-based groups to think about as well, is that not everything is meant to get harvested, replicated, and set out for pace and scale. Some things really are a lot more complicated than that and can't be just replicated. I'm wondering if we have any other questions in the room. Okay, one more. All right. Um, this question is, have you seen resistance to prescribed burns in wildfire affected communities that have experienced the trauma of fire? How have you handled this? especially understanding that managed burns don't always go as planned. For example, 2022 in New Mexico last week in the McKenzie Valley. Absolutely. Um, I think this gets kind of to what I was saying in that slide that I was showing about, you know, our relationship with fire at the Watershed Center and in Hayfork. We were so, so excited before we had a lot of individual negative really, um, impacts of fire about prescribed fire. And we still are huge, huge advocates of prescribed fire. But I don't think we always recognize and realize the trauma and the real impacts that happen from wildfires. I read, I read a, an article that said that the levels of PTSD in people who've been evacuated from a fire are the same as in active Mil uh, military service people. That was really shocking to me. I was like, we are going to have some serious mental health crisis in this country when we start evacuating all of the communities that are going to experience serious wildfires. We do not have the mental health resources to deal with that. So I think you have to take this really seriously. We've done a lot of trauma-informed work. We do well-being for practitioners to deal with all of the sort of secondhand trauma that folks deal with to help them think about who they're engaging with. We started doing some post-fire work without understanding what that was like, and we learned a lot of really hard lessons. So we start providing warnings as we talk about things, making sure people can opt into conversations or opt out of conversations. We sometimes bring mental health professionals to work. A lot of our prescribed fire work in the fire networks um, really is about pushing the boundaries of who's able to engage with fire. And so we have a whole program called WTREX, which is really about women and under other underrepresented genders in fire. And those spaces have been really amazing, but they've also led to some really intense emotional situations where people are talking about intense trauma um, and experiences that they've had. And so we've learned a lot about what happens when you bring kind of those affinity groups together. So I think there's both in the workforce itself, as well as in communities with residents, I think you have to be really thoughtful and understand that not everyone's experience with fire is positive. You know, I heard, I was recently on a, a tour in, in paradise and they said, what do you do when we're trying to tell kids that like, go out in nature, it's the best coping mechanism and people are afraid nature is trying to kill them. Like that is really a loss of an opportunity that many of us, I think, have relied on is being able to go outside and think about that as a place of refuge. And so I think you have to just be sensitive to that, recognize that that's some people's experience and figure out how to invite them into other experiences. One of the things we often do on our small prescribed fires is actually invite residents to be part of them so that they can build new and different experiences with fire so that their only experience isn't about having to drive through a wildfire evacuation. So that's one of the ways that we really try to invite people into building new memories, new sensory recognitions with fire, but that's not for everyone. And I think it's really important not to push that on people and to invite it instead. Uh, 
I think that concludes our, our lecture series. I'd like to thank you all for joining us online and in person. And I'd really like to thank Michelle and Mindy for the time they took to tell their stories today. Thank you.